Let me get started. So, okay, uh, what about everybody? So, today we're going to get the Mommy. Uh, Mommy got a PhD at the uh, University of Yale in 2016. Then uh, she was a postdoctoral fellow at Cali IPA in Japan. Then now uh, she's a J JSPS research, uh, research fellow at, uh, at Nagoya University at the Kobayashi Maskawa Institute. And also uh, a postdoctoral fellow at the Stewart Observatory at Arizona University. She's an expert in modeling systematics, in cosmological analysis using galaxy clusters, and in, in the identification of galaxy clusters at Kaiship, and also is a co leader of the PFS uh, working, uh, cosmology working group. And uh, she will tell us about uh, was accurate cosmological measurements with optical clusters. So, yeah. thank please, you. Simone. <laughs> well, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. So, today I want to talk about how we can actually use optical clusters to the accurate cosmological measurement. And this is a work with Yon Supert and um, Masahiro Takada at Columbia IPMU and also HSC Weekland in working group. So before jumping into the cluster cosmology, I briefly summarize where we are and where we will be in terms of the galaxy surveys. So right now, um, we are here in 2022. So now we finish uh, dark energy survey and HSC imaging survey, both are uh, photometric survey. And last year, dark energy spectroscopic instrument, which we often call like DAISY, uh, started and there will be more to come. And apparently, uh, every 10 years, the number of galaxies we observe increase 10 times more, which means that we have a lot of data and by increasing the amount of data that we can use to uh, measure cosmological parameters, the statistical precision also increase a lot. But the question, but the thing is, when the statistical precision like, uh, improves a lot, we also need to like control the systematics at the level uh, we can do like cosmological uh, measurement accurately. So the requirement for the systematics handling becomes more stringent. And the question is, are we actually ready to deal with the future galaxy survey data? And currently we think that we can explain our universe with simply this uh, six parameter model, which we often call standard cosmological model. And of course, there are many more complicated theoretical models, but we think that this six parameter roughly explain what we observe right now. And the six parameter is matter density, baryon density, Hubble parameter, cosmological constant, and initial amplitude, which we call like sigma eight and slope of slope n of our uh, spectrum fluctuations. And the primary goal of current and future galaxy survey is accurately measure those parameters. And the reason for this is that, okay, we know roughly how our universe is made of, like dark energy, dark matter, and ordinary matters. And, but we don't really, not the answer for the nature of dark energy, dark matter, and also primordial fluctuations. And to, to get idea about those questions, one way to do is uh, getting the measurement, uh, getting those numbers uh, more precisely to see whether uh, this is actually a viable model to explain our universe. And of course, another question is, does this model actually explain our universe in a consistent manner? So from the R universe, we have a CMB, a cosmic microwave background, which gives the power spectrum. And by fitting the model to the data, we get the, this pie chart, which shows the energy density of our universe. But we can also do the same thing from the late time universe by uh, looking at the galaxies and, or supernovae type 1a. And the question is like, do those uh, different cosmological probes give the same answer? And there are currently like two tensions. One is Hubble constant, which is a measure of the expansion rate of the universe. And as you can see that uh, Planck or our universe 
Prof uh, prefer smaller value for uh, Hubble constant, while the distance ladder or holy cow, which is a time delay, uh, which use a strong lensing and to, to measure the Hubble constant, like they are roughly like 4.4 sigma away uh, from each other. So where this uh, difference come from, is it due to like the lack of accurately um, controlling the systematics or is it because a simple six parameter model is not sufficient to, to explain those difference? Another tension is so-called uh, SA tension. And S8 is a combination of sigma 8 and omega matter, which measures the clumpiness of the density of fluctuations. And Planck prefer uh, high S8, while lensing and clusters consistently prefer uh, lower S8. And this, is, this figure is from the DSY1 optical cluster. So the dashed line and the gray contour is a result from the optical cluster. And what people have been wondering was, okay, so lensing and clusters have been giving consistently uh, lower value for S8 compared to CMB. But now like optical cluster gives uh, like a lot smaller value of S8. And the problem is, it's DSY1 three times two, which is a combination of cosmic sphere, galaxy galaxy lensing and galaxy clustering and this DSY1 optical cluster, they basically like uh, use the same data set. So the discrepancy between DSY1 three times two and uh, optical cluster is a method methodological difference. So where things went wrong. And also the another thing is that even though the previous cluster measurement are more consistent with the lensing probe, the first three are from the CMB. And this WPG, uh, which stands for weighing the giant, is an X-ray cluster. And the last one, SDSS, is optical, optical cluster. But this S8 is a, a little bit tricky parameter to compare because so the reason why DSY1 cluster has a lower S8 compared to the rest was that they their preferred omega matter value was 0.2, and sigma 8 was consistent. So that's why S8 was lower. Uh, SDSS, if you actually look at the contour plot for omega matter and sigma 8 uh, independently, they actually also prefer low omega matter, like 0.2. But because the SDSS uh, sigma 8 was uh, higher, they basically compensate. So it looks reasonable in the SA uh, constraints, but it's actually not agreeing with any of the cosmological probes. So the question, some of the people start wondering, like, can we actually use optical clusters to do the cosmology? And so today, what I want to talk is that how we can use clusters as the cosmological probe, but more importantly, how we can accurately constrain cosmology using optical clusters. And if I have extra time, I want to briefly touch about future fiber spectroscopic galaxy surveys, uh, Davian PFS, and what kind of things like you need to keep in mind when you are actually using all those data. And the uh, takeaway message uh, from my talk uh, is that preferential selection of structure which can be clusters or galaxies, will bias cosmology analysis. So in order to do cosmology accurately, you really need to understand how observation, like what kind of like structure uh, galaxy surveys are observing. Okay, so how we can use clusters as a cosmological probe? It's actually very simple. You can just count the number of clusters and you can constrain the cosmological parameter. And the reason is that because the massive end of halo mass function is very sensitive to the cosmological parameters. So the, those two pictures are a snapshot from the embodied simulations with and without dark energy. And even from eye, you can see that the structures are very, looks very different. Um, you see more 
uh, massive halos in the simulation from uh, with dark energy. And if you look at the halo mass function, uh, which are normalized at low redshift, the evolution of the halo mass function is also different when you have dark energy and when you don't. So the background cosmology actually affects the number of clusters. But also because clusters are formed from the highest density peaks in the initial density field, uh, we can, the number of the cluster is also uh, sensitive to sigma eight, uh, which is a measure of the promptness of the density fluctuation. When sigma eight is higher, which means that there are more number of high density peaks and therefore uh, one number of clusters. So with, by counting the number of clusters, um, you can constrain omega matter and sigma it well. And actually this simple method can be statistically competitive with other large scale structure probe. So according to the cosmic vision report, uh, there's a sentence saying that the number of massive galaxy uh, clusters could emerge as the most powerful cosmological probe. So this is a figure uh, uh, which shows a statistical precision for the sigma 11 instead of sigma eight, but those are uh, the same thing. It's just a different scale to normalize. And what this figure is showing that if we can actually detect uh, clusters whose halo mass is roughly 10 to the 14, which is a bottom black line, even uh, for uh, with a stage three dark energy survey, it actually can do better than the stage three experiment combining Planck weak lensing BAO and supernovae. What is and, the percentage of scatter that they assume in the mass observable uh, relationship? I think they don't assume anything, okay. and I think I will. <laughs> So there is a big if statement um, for, for the sentence after the, uh, in the cosmic vision report. So if the mass of the cluster can be accurately measured and the, as you say, the, the fluctuation in the mass distribution uh, can also like alter the precision that we can constrain. And the challenge in the cluster cosmology is that cluster mass is not a direct observable. So what we actually want is a number of halos as a function of halo mass, which is sensitive to omega matter and sigma eight. But what we actually observe is a number of clusters as a function of observable. And this observable will depend on a type of survey that you use. And in order to connect the theory and what we observe, you need some kind of assumption between mass and observable, which we call mass observable relation. So what we have from theory, from theory is that n-body simulations. And from the observations, we have X-ray, CMB, and optical to detect clusters. And for X-ray survey, the observable is uh, X-ray brightness. And usually X-ray cluster catalog is known to have high purity and completeness, meaning that there won't be many false detection. However, uh, the mass limit increase with redshift, meaning that X-ray is a very good way to detect clusters at low redshift, but at higher redshift, uh, this method only can detect very massive halos or clusters. Another method is uh, using CMB uh, through the Sonia-F Zodovich effect which is an inverse constant uh, scattering of CMB photons in inter intercluster medium and the uh, observable is SD decrement, which people often call YSD. And this is actually a very good way to detect high redshift clusters because uh, detection rate uh, using this S uh, method is redshift independent. So you can actually um, detect the clusters um, independent from the redshift. However, right now um, it's very, it's limited to very massive clusters. So the number of clusters you can detect uh, using this effect is uh, limited. 
And optical cluster, which use uh, imaging survey or photometric surveys, is probably the most traditional way to detect clusters. So basically, you have the image of the galaxies, and you find the overdense region of the galaxy. And observable is the number of galaxies in the cluster, which we often call richness. And optical cluster usually have high completeness, and also we can detect the low mass uh, clusters, meaning that the number of clusters we can detect is much more than like uh, SZ or X-ray. However, um, there are many more systematics uh, compared to other methods for optical. And in order to understand how the halo mass and observables are related, there are many ways to measure halo mass, but the, best, the best way is using the gravitational lens. So gravitational lensing is like gravitational potential due to clusters, which we also call lens, uh, will bend the light from the distant galaxies and distorts the image of the galaxy shape. So if so there is a cluster and there is a galaxy behind, and the light coming from the galaxy will be bent. So if the galaxy is actually right behind the cluster, you see like two images of the same galaxy. But if the galaxy positions are slightly away from the center of the cluster, the shape will be distorted, which is shown uh, in the right figure. And by using this uh, gravitational lensing, we can actually measure halo mass because the shape distortion due to the gravitational potential is, like, is proportional to mass density along the line of sight. So you can actually measure how much matter there is uh, along the line of sight. So despite the fact that there are a lot of systematics, why we wanna do cluster cosmology with optical clusters? The first thing is that optical allows us to detect low mass uh, clusters. So this is a mass threshold uh, as a function of the redshift for different surveys. So ACT pole and SPT pole are the CMV surveys. And as you can see that um, those are relatively massive clusters, but um, somewhat redshift independent manner you can identify uh, clusters and it can go up to higher redshift. Iwajita is an X-ray. And as you can see that the mass threshold really depends on the redshift. And okay, DS and LSSC, it's kind of hard to see the line, but can actually detect the clusters around like 10 to the 14 solar masses up to redshift one. And the reason that uh, with optical, it's very hard to find uh, clusters after redshift one is because we usually use red galaxies to identify uh, over dense regions. Because compared to blue galaxies, red galaxies has less uh, distance uncertainty along the line of sight. And, but, also, clusters at high redshift start having the blue galaxies. So at higher redshift, it's harder to uh, detect uh, clusters with this method. But by pushing to the lower mass uh, clusters, you have more number of clusters, which means that you can do better weak lensing mass measurement, which is shown here that the black line is a total error, and the red dashed line is a weak lensing error only. And this weak lensing error only meaning that uh, shape measurement error. And this black line in also includes a uh, halo tree actuality. So what it really means that when you actually measure the halo mass for, uh, for the clusters, we usually assume that spherical halos, but actually halos are not spherical, like it's a tree actual. And this kind of shape variation actually also uh, matter and uh, contribute as error. And another advantage of optical cluster is that galaxy lensing measurement comes free because we use the uh, photometric data. On the other hand, for X-ray and SD, if you wanna do a like, galaxy lensing measurement, uh, you need a follow-up survey. 
So this is a schematic picture of uh, optical cluster cosmology that once you set the cosmological parameters, you can, uh, you can predict the halo mass functions uh, in the modeling side. And for the observational side, you find the cluster, which gives the number of clusters as a function of richness. And you use weak lensing to measure the halo mass. And that will uh, connect the halo mass function and abundance through the mass richness relation. And you get cosmology. And this is a latest result from DSY1. As you can see, so this is a cluster contour, while this red is a DS3 times two. So what this is saying that uh, with the cluster, the constraints to of omega matter is like around 0.2 and cos sigma eight, which roughly agree with other <coughs> cosmological probes. But actually this result was after they did the uh, blinding. So usually when we do cosmological analysis, we do like blind analysis. What it means is that um, in all, to avoid the bias in our expectation, like how the cosmological contour looks like, we usually um, hide one of the data vector so that we don't, uh, our bias doesn't come into the cosmological constraints. So the originally, the result was this gray contour. Uh, and then people puzzled that, okay, now we get a low mega matter and high sigma, and it doesn't really agree with any other cosmological probe. And there are many possible systematics. So membership dilution is that uh, cluster members sometimes also like considered as a source galaxies in the weak lensing measurement, which, uh, which dilute the lensing signal. So which can bias the mass measurement of the through the weak lensing or miscentering, meaning that the, we misidentify the cluster center. And halo tree actuality is that the shape variation in halos. So after they did, after they unblind, they reanalyze the data by fixing some of the uh, systematic models. And then they got, got this red contour. So, and the difference between those two contours are the modeling of the projection effect. So what is projection effect? It's a misidentification of member galaxies along the line of sight. Because we usually detect uh, clusters from the image, you don't know the distance along the line of sight. So some of the galaxies within this circle are actually within the clusters, but some of them are just like happen to be close by. And this actually uh, alters the mass richness relationship. So in order to uh, investigate how the projection effect matters for what we observe, what we did is that we construct like two mock cluster catalog. One is a uh, true cluster sample, meaning that uh, from the body simulation, we have well-defined halos. And we just say that the number of galaxies within the halo, we consider as a richness. So this is a true, uh, if we have a perfect knowledge about the position of the galaxies, we can get this kind of cluster sample. But in reality, it's not. So then like I run the cluster finder, which is which mimics the cluster finder used in the observational data. So basically what it does is that it finds the over density region of red galaxies, but also determine cluster center and member galaxies iteratively. And because there is a distance uncertainty along the line of sight, the way I find the over dense region is that I use this kind of cylinder to group all the galaxies within this cylinder as a member. So that's the major difference between true cluster and observed cluster. And if you look at the mass richness relationship between those two cluster catalog, where um, solid line is the mass richness relation for true cluster, 
and that line is uh, for observed clusters. As you can see that, especially at low richness, like low mass clusters, observed cluster contains much more uh, low mass halos. This is because they are actually not clusters, but because of like um, interlopers along the line of sight, that boost the uh, observed richness. That's why they are considered as uh, clusters. So the mass richness relationship will be broadened by the projection. And how this effect can bias cosmological frames. So this is a little bit basic thought. So please focus on this omega matter and sigma 8. And this alpha, lambda naught, and sigma are the nuisance parameters for the mass richness relation. And this blue is that when you can actually model the relationship between true richness and observed richness. And this pink is when you ignore the projection. So if you can accurately model the relationship between true and observed richness, you get correct omega matter and uh, sigma eight. However, if you ignore the projection effect, you get low omega matter and high sigma eight, which is what we see in the ESY1 cluster. And is this change in mass richness relation the end of story? If so, we can just like model the projection effect in the mass richness relation and we can just do the cosmology. But, but there are like also other contaminants like miscentering or something. So is sure, this sure. Like the, the biggest effect or? Uh, so those things will come into the weak lens. Yeah, and of course, like this is a very like simple diagram. So, in order to do the weak lensing measurement accurately, like miscentering, triaxiality, uh, member dilution, those things has to be modeled to infer the mass richness relation. But a uh, projection effect is um, different because this projection effect alters the mass richness relation directly while other systematics are more coming from the weak lensing. But because projection effects are caused by the correlated structure, there might be some effect on the weak lensing as well. So what we did was we compared the lensing signal between observed and true, cl uh, true, true clusters. So what you can see is that on the small scale, you see like suppressions or some increase between observed and true clusters. But on large scale, you see like a boost. And actually on small scale, so for example, for the low richness cluster, like 20 to 30, like there is a suppression on small scale. It's because uh, low richness clusters contain more low mass halos. And for the large richness beam, observed cluster actually contain more larger halos. That's why the amplitude is slightly larger. So the on small scale, the difference between observed and cluster lensing signal comes from the mass difference. Like the distribution of the mass of the sample are different. However, this mass difference doesn't really explain the boost on the two halo term. So where this comes from? Actually, um, with respect to the true clusters, the distribution of observed cluster is anisotropic. So this is a ratio of observed cluster distribution with respect to true uh, in two-dimensional contour. So this x-axis is a perpendicular direction and y-axis is along the line of sight. And what this figure is showing is that red means that there are more number of clusters. So along the line of sight, you see more, class, more observed cluster compared to the true. And that's why this kind of anisotropic structure causes a boost on large scale, because what you actually see in the lensing signal is uh, integrating over along the line of sight. That's why the boost happens. And this is because cluster finder preferentially uh, identify clusters on aligned filaments along the line of sight. So like cluster finder 
say that if the, there is a filament aligned on the line of sight, it's more likely to say there is a cluster. And that's called the uh, unisotropic distribution and also boosts the clustering and lensing signal. Yes. I think I've lost the lost the I said I've misunderstood the book. Doesn't this then they're saying that there's an, there's extra lensing because there's more stuff along the line of sight. Sorry? There's, there's extra lensing because there's more stuff along the line of sight and these are source clusters. Um, so the, the, the red stuff in this picture is mm -hmm. also doing the lensing. No. So well so the the size of the cluster is one megaparsec. So like somewhere here. So you don't really, so the halos, it looks like halos are really lining up, but it's actually not. And as long as it's not perfectly aligned to the center of the clusters, it won't contaminate the lensing signal on small scale. And that's what this figure is showing that on small scale, you don't really see the boost. It's because well, this delta sigma is not really integrating, just not only just integrating along the line of sight, like it's, you are actually subtracting the matter within the radius. So that's probably part of the reason that you don't see that much boost on small scale. Um, actually, I can show the next figure. So this is sigma of R. And maybe I should just write this ranging signal is um, within the radius minus. And this signal part is actually the cluster matter phosphorylation. So, as you say, that for sigma of R, you see some excess boost even within the small scale. But for the delta sigma, you don't really see uh, this boost. So you can, if you only use one halo term or small scale information, uh, you can actually accurately measure the halo mass. And so what we did was modeling the projection effect. So this blue line is a measured uh, sigma of R. And this orange prediction is that since I know the mass distribution from the mock, we can predict how it should look like if it's not, if the observed clusters is actually not distributed unisotropically. So, the difference is that caused by the anisotropy in the observed cluster. And what we want to do is that uh, on top of the orange line, we want to model this uh, excess, like the boost in the amplitude uh, using the three parameters. And those are three parameters. And what we do for the cluster cosmology analysis is that we now decide not to use mass richness relation because by using mass richness relation, the cosmology analysis has two steps. Like you use weak lensing to infer the halo mass and get the mass richness relation and you use abundance to constrain the cosmology. But you can also do like one step full forward modeling. So from the cosmological parameters, uh, you can get halo mass functions and halo clustering. But, and for the systematics or mass richness relation projection effect, miscentering and photo, photo Z error, we can uh, model uh, using the nuisance parameters and we can get abundance lensing and clustering. And for the observational side, we find clusters and do the same thing and we can get the cosmology. And uh, one of the advantages of this method is that if you infer halo mass from the lensing to get mass richness relation, all the information coming from the lensing is just like halo mass. But if you actually use the lensing signal on all scale, on small scale, like 
it's sensitive to the halo mass, but also on large scale, it's proportional to the cluster bias, which is, uh, which is proportional to mass. And by also combining the cluster clustering, which is a cluster bias square, you have uh, more information uh, you can get from the cluster observables. And we, we validate our pipeline and model uh, using like several different models, which have di uh, different level of systematics. But what this figure is showing that we get uh, collect cosmological parameters uh, from the mocks. So what we did was when you create the mocks, like uh, yeah. like when you create the mocks, I just had a question about that. So like for the halos, we know that like the bionic effects can change uh, the halo mass by ten percent or something. Uh, do you include that effect? Sorry, could you repeat again? Uh, the halo mass can change by 10% or something due to baryonic effects. Uh, we don't use a small scale, like that much small scale. So baryonic effect matters for very small scale uh, uh, on the lensing scale, <coughs> but we use like, um, like 0.2 mega per sec. And there, like the baryonic effect won't affect much for the uh, mass measurement. So if you want to push to smaller scale to get more information, yes, baryonic effect is very important. Even for the halo abundance, like uh, just the masses of halos also are different. Uh, with the baryonic effect? Yes. How much is it, can it be different? Like five to 10%. Like Let's to see. 14. On what many scales? 10 to the 14. Could, so it could bias, but actually the constraining power for the optical clusters are not the level, not there yet, I think. Um, but maybe it, it would be nice to check how, how much um, those changes also matters. Okay, so now um, we apply our pipeline to the strong lead mapper clusters, where it covers like it is 300 square degree from redshift 1.1 to 0.33 uh, in the richness beams of 20 to 30, 30 to like four richness beams. And in total, we have 8,000 clusters. And for the lensing measurement, we use HSC uh, first year data. So it, the area wise, it's like 137 square degree, but the main redshift of the source galaxy is at one. And the signal to noise ratio wise, HSC for CR data was comparable to the Sloan lensing signal. But there is actually another reason that we decide to use HSC for, for CR data. So if you are curious about the reason, uh, please ask me later. And maybe I will skip those. And this is the result. So this, okay, it's very hard to see in this screen, but this is a, a cosmology constraint. And this, yeah, sorry. This is a, this uh, peaked in green is a plunk. So what we get is that we actually have really nice agreement between plunk and uh, cluster and sigma eight, Planck prefers slightly larger sigma eight than uh, cluster, but for S8, we are within one sigma. Yes. And if you compare what we got to other uh, constraints from the Sloan, which use the uh, abundance and the mass richness relation, you, you see that you know, the range is very different. So. Omega matter is roughly like 0.3 for our case, while their constraints are like at 0.2 and sigma 8 is 0.9. So this is what I meant that when you combine omega matter and sigma 8 to get S8, they got um, reasonable S8 uh, compared to lensing and cluster, other cluster measurement, but they are really getting lower sigma 8. So if I could overplot sigma eight is somewhere here and omega matter is somewhere here. So the summary is that um, 
optical clusters have many systematics and projection effect is one of the biggest uncertainty or systematics. And it's not only like change the mass richness simulation, but it also affects the lensing and clustering signal. And this is because preferential selection of aligned filaments along the line of sight. And it caused that observed cluster actually disturb the distribution of the observed cluster is anisotropic and it actually boosts the amplitude of lensing and clustering. But by modeling the projection effect uh, properly, we can actually constrain cosmological parameters uh, with in the reasonable agreement with other lensing and cluster regime. And this is a all the available um, constraints for omega matter and sigma uh, varying from the RSD cluster uh, with lensing, also combining galaxy clusters. And what's next? Um, HSC actually finished the survey last year. And now people are working on the cosmology analysis uh, for Y3, which is roughly 430 square feet. And one of the advantages of HSC is that it's much deeper than SDSS. So we can actually uh, detect the optical clusters up to redshift 1.2. So we can actually uh, track down the evolution of the galaxy clusters. And we can see this is a number of clusters from the HSC clusters uh, as a function of redshift. And you can see that the halo uh, abundance uh, as a function of the richness uh, change as redshift evolves. So this will come hopefully uh, early next year. And since I have a little bit more time, yes. um, I just want to briefly touch on uh, future spectroscopic survey, which is uh, DAISY and PFS. And well, this is uh, advertisement for PFS, I will skip. Well, but one thing, um, so PFS and DESI are somewhat complementary in the sense that DESI will cover 10 times larger areas than PFS, but PFS can go deeper. So this is a number density of uh, galaxies that DESI and PFS observe and you create. So DESI will observe emission line galaxies up to redshift 1.6. And above 1.6, uh, they will measure BAO using Lyman alpha. However, uh, PFS can actually um, observe emission line galaxies from 1.6 to 2.4. And Euclid will also observe uh, emission line galaxy up to two. So from redshift two to 2.4, PFS is the only instrument which can observe emission line galaxies. And also because uh, PFS uses Suba uh, telescope, which is an eight meter telescope, we will observe a higher number density of emission line galaxies, meaning that we can actually measure small scale clustering uh, more accurately. So the most DESI and PFS uh, fibers, like use fiber spectrograph. Meaning that in order to get the spectra, uh, they need to put fibers. So from the target galaxies, you need to pick up what galaxies to observe. And what's happening is that we want to measure the clustering signal of the galaxies. But once we put uh, fibers or once we select the galaxies to observe, that alters the clustering signal. So this black line is a true underlying uh, clustering signal of the galaxies. And the blue dust is after you select uh, galaxies to observe, after you put the fibers. And if you actually look at a different component, like the, with respect to line of sight, the perpendicular direction doesn't really uh, get suppressed, but Along the line of sight, the clustering signal uh, really suppressed. And this is because there are like several differences between the previous survey and PFS and DESI. So Sron also used a fiber spectrograph. But for the case of Sron, they have very high success rate. 
and uh, greater than 90 percent and I think on average it was like 95 or 98 um, and the number of target galaxy for the case of Sloan was smaller than the number of available fibers however for the case of PFS and DESI because we those surveys want to go to like higher redshift. They need to cover a larger conobin volume. So they don't want to waste fibers. So both surveys prepare more number of target galaxy than the number of fiber available, which leads to the low success rate. So for the case of Sloan, there was also a program in the clustering measurement, which is called a fiber collision that when two objects are so close to each other, you can only uh, put fibers in one of them. So uh, the other galaxy don't get spectra, and that actually alters a clustering signal. But there are many ways to uh, mitigate uh, this fiber collision problem. And part of the reason was, um, especially both survey, which goes from 0.15 to 0.43 for low Z and 0.43 to 0.7 for uh, CMOS, they have narrower redshift range. So in order to collect a fiber collision uh, issue, they can actually use angular clustering of target galaxies. However, for PFS and DESI, we will use robotic fibers and plate already has a uniform hole, which means that uh, Fibers are placed uniformly, and also fiber has a finite factorial area. So that, oh, that is one of the reasons that it affects to the clustering signal. But also the richest range that those surveys cover is much deeper, meaning that when you compute the angular clustering of target galaxies, it's almost uniform. So you can't really use angular clustering to correct the issue that the FS and DESI has. So there are two effects. One is that due to the tiling. So as I say that the number of target galaxy is larger than the number of available fiber, meaning that for each uh, observing directions, there is some like fluctuation in the number of target galaxies, which uh, has the information on the long wave, uh, sorry, long wave mode fluctuation. But because the number of fiber is fixed, um, it, you know, by observing the, those galaxies, the long wave mode fluctuations are lost. Another uh, effect is on small scales, because we use robotic fibers, it has finite area to patrol meaning that for each fibers, there are a number of target galaxies available. And depends on the number of visits, if it's two visits, even there are like five target galaxies, you can only pick two of them. However, if in the uh, patrol region, if there is only one galaxy, those galaxies always get spectra, meaning that because of this design, um, galaxies in under dense regions are preferentially observed. And what it does is that on the large scale, uh, because of the tiling, it suppresses the clustering. And on small scale, because of the finite patrol region, like it suppresses the clustering. And the solution for this is so called a pairwise inverse probability weighting method. So the sch schematic idea is that this R is a patrol area of the fibers. So if the two galaxies whose distance is less than R, meaning that once I put the fiber to this galaxy A, I can't observe B. So the, the second fiber has to go to D, and C, D or C. And if I pick a B, like there is no other uh, galaxies that we can observe meaning that each pair of galaxies have different probability to be observed. And what this method does is that it computes the likelihood to be observed for each pair and use that as an inverse weight. And it actually works well. Um, this is a ratio of 
is the IP method with respect to the true underlying clustering. And this red dashed line is when you use a PIP method and it actually recovers the clustering on all scale. But the problem of this method is that it requires to uh, store the information of n square for the two point correlation function. And if you want to do like higher order statistics, like by spectrum or three spec uh, four point correlation function, you need to store all the probability for all the pairs, meaning that it's proportional to n square, uh, n cube, or n to the four. So I don't know whether that's a strategy that Daisy will do. Um, for PFS, we are currently still under debating, but when you are using like measures like bi spectrum, tri spectra, uh, please make sure that what kind of correction methods are used and how it's measured. Because you know if the correction methods are not really used, uh, the measured bi spectrum or full point correlation function can be biased. So. Um, I will finish here. Thank you for listening. Okay, so we have time for more questions. Misha and Fazu. Great talk, thank you. So um, there is still, you know, this essay tension from the DS clusters, right? Yeah. Uh, and that prefers sort of um, omega matter to be even lower than other probes, like 0.17 or something. And there were some papers uh, last year. So, do you think that if you apply your pipeline to this data set, then you'll be able to fix this issue as well? Probably, but I mean, so actually, DS people are uh, using our modeling of the projection effect and doing the analysis. So until that result come out, I can't really say things for sure. But I think the problem was the DS cluster analysis. So any like optical cluster analysis was like when you measure the mass from the lensing, if you use all the scale, like you know, there is a boost in the amplitude, but uh, that was ignored. And I think that caused uh, that leads to the misestimation of the hill mass. And can lead to that. Want to read that? I guess I don't understand why you can't measure and quantify that effect using large scale cosmological simulation. Because they have the filaments, you can do whatever observations you want on them. Why? Why can't you quantify it? Why? So, is your question like why people in DS, even though like they have like large simulations, like they didn't realize about this effect? Right. So, part of the reason is that um, DS people are using some kind of semi-analytical modeling for the galaxies, which probably have different color distribution than the real observations. And they probably likely to underestimate the distance uncertainty based on the color. I think that's why. So I know many people in DS, and some some people are now working in the cylinder methods to quantify the projection effect. Then, like they actually get the same result, and they they find the same effect. So yeah, I think it's just reproducing galaxy color. In realistic manner, is very hard. I do so, oh yeah, quick, quick, quick. So, so SDS's cluster didn't account for this projection project effect to get the smudge parameter or not? Yeah. So that SDSS result was also from the same people for this analysis for the years. So the same methodology. And actually, there is a reason that I. You have time to yeah. There is a reason why I decided to use HSC lens measurement. Because when we actually use SDSS lensing measurement to test our pipeline, we actually get, okay, I'm sorry that this is very hard to see. Um, this is a prank, Omega Master. This blue is a SDSS fiducial, meaning that 
our pipeline with SDSS lensing. We actually got low mega matter consistent with DSY1 and large sigma 8. And the reason for that is that uh, when you do the lensing measurement with long data, the source galaxy, the mean source redshift is like 0.4. So in order to select the source galaxies from clusters, you really need to select all the source galaxies behind the lens, um, which means that there will be more contamination from the correlated structure. And what this figure is showing is that this blue line is from Sloan lensing measurement and HSC is orange. And for small scale, like they are agreeing each other. But as you can see on large scale, there is a slight difference. And you may think that you know, this is a tiny effect, but this, if I take the ratio between the HSC and SDSS lensing measurement, the difference is roughly 20%. So what happened is that there is an uncorrected uh, error in the CSS lensing signal, which somehow supplies the lensing signal on large scale. But because I'm using the projection effect boost model for lensing, in order to fit both clustering and lensing simultaneously, that leads to like artificially small omega matter. So, I mean, lensing is very hard to do accurately and you really need to make sure how you, how you select source galaxies and what kind of system at least you have. Know. Like uh, for this projection effects, like you, I mean, if you cross correlate with some SZ uh, clusters or something which do not have these projection effects so mm -hmm. severe in them, then maybe you can reduce it. But yeah, but the problem with SZ is that uh, overall collisions are usually small, and also SZ clusters are usually massive ends. So we can do the cross match for the massive side, but this contamination usually coming from the low mass clusters. So so what do you mean by low mass? Just to have a number, it's ten like to the fourteen. Yeah. So. For the SD cluster, it's usually like currently like five, five times 10 to the 14. And for optical, we can push the mass limit to go up like 10 to the 14. And we wanna, if we can get SD signal for those low mass clusters, yes. But you will, I mean, like this SO, like, uh, will be able to, I guess. Even CMBS4, it will be like three times 10 to the 14. And the, I mean, you have to cut it because of baryonic. I mean, they, they do all the things below. But yeah, yeah, but okay. if you are pushing the sensitivity in the SD survey or CMB survey, similar kind of effect actually um, kicks in. Sure, the proportionality to the mass is different between SD and the, like number, but SD clusters are not perfect. Like, they were also affect, uh, affected by the projection effect. You're saying the filament also contains some hot gas. And... Okay, if there are no more questions, I think we are right to the hour. And <laughs> thanks for me again. For the Thank you.